Ever feel like you're doing this teaching thing alone? You don't have to be. Share Teaching is all about sharing the workload through the power of collaboration and teamwork. Together, we'll walk through all the difficult parts of teaching and learn how to streamline our processes, fine tune our time management, and develop a more manageable workload. If that sounds like a dream come true to you, then welcome to the Shared Teaching Podcast. Let's share in the teaching to make those dreams a reality. Now here's today's Shared Teaching. Hello and welcome to the last episode of the Shared Teaching Podcast in 2023. Don't be alarmed though, there's lots more episodes coming your way in 2024, so make sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you listen to your podcasts so that you don't miss out on any future episodes, and you can even ask for them to automatically download to your phone. It's amazing, it's awesome, it's fun. I'm so glad you're here. I have a very special guest with me today. Today we are having a conversation with Andrea Haas. Andrea is a guest that is very passionate about putting the learning in the hands of students, and she holds a master's degree with a reading emphasis, and she also has been nationally board certified in literacy. She spent 20 years in education. She's still in education supporting teachers, and she's taught everything from general education to special education, first, second, and fourth grade. And she's here with us today to talk all about student-centered practices in reading. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome our guest, Andrea. All right, so I'd love to welcome Andrea Haas to the Share Teaching Podcast. So thank you so much for agreeing to join me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about student-centered practices in reading, and I'm really curious like what that even means. So can we just start off talking about what that is or what it might look like? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. So uh, when you think of student-centered instruction, you're thinking about looking at the whole child, and you're also thinking about how can you encourage executive functioning, how can you encourage student agency within your classroom, and really start putting some of the ownership on the learning onto the kids. And so for reading specifically, I like to say to the teachers I work with that you want to kind of create like this reading scape, like a landscape of like the whole situation of your of your reader. So not just like what the assessments are telling you, but who they are as a reader. You know, what's their beliefs about reading? You know, have they struggled or have they been succeeding? Kind of what are their habits about reading? Do they think that reading is something that they just do because out of compliance or is it something that they like enjoy engaging in and can see the relevancy into their life, those kinds of things. And I also think that, you know, especially lately, we've focused a lot on some of the new research that's come out and it's on a big push now back on foundational literacy skills and then thinking about fluency and some comprehension, but also some of the more recent research has shown us that we really need to have some self-regulation. Like kids actually have to have some of those executive functioning skills in order to manage all the things that have to happen to be a proficient reader. And they also need to have engagement and motivation. (laughs) And I don't think that, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) And none of the commercial assessments that I have seen uh, would measure engagement and motivation. That's going to have to come from different kinds of observational data that you're taking or having conversations with with the students. Right. And the teacher is still very much needed in the classroom (laughs) in order to kind of (laughs) navigate some of those pieces that are missing from just traditional curriculum. Yeah, exactly. And so I like to encourage teachers to just think about, you know, revealing kind of like taking the mask off of like, who are these kiddos and where are they coming from? And just going through those steps. So it can be as easy as just for engagement that you sit and you watch your class while they're doing some silent reading or independent reading or, you know, whatever. And just like notice, like take data. Who is, you know, in a text? Who is staring out the window? 
who is talking to their neighbors, who is picking up a book, then putting another book down, then picking up another book, then putting it down, or who is kind of like flying under the radar and maybe looks like they're reading, but really they're just turning the pages, those kinds of things. Like who, like really what is the engagement of the, of them in interacting with the text? And really that, that's, you know, that can just be like 10 minutes of, of just you sitting there and watching and just kind of seeing what you see. And that can give you a lot of information about who might need a little bit more support on what does it look like when we are reading and what kind of behavior should I be seeing and what kind of things should you be doing when you're reading a text? Right. And what grade level would you say that this is geared towards? I, I mean, I think you can do that really at any age. I mean, not obviously not like beginning of the year kindergarten. I mean, th- those guys are still right. schoolers. <laughs> So I'm not, give them till like, December, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not talking about them, maybe, but, but you know, I think also sometimes we don't give our students enough credit for what they can take on, the kinds of thinking they can do, and the kinds of responsibility they can have. Especially when you just kind of are real with them and explain to them, like, this is why we're doing this, and this is why this matters. This is how this, this is relevant to your life. <laughs> like, this is this is what's important about it, and so. I think that even with younger kids, with some scaffolding, you can still get them to take some ownership over what they're doing in their reading, especially in their, you know, independent practice time. And it can be based off of what you're doing in some small groups. It can be based off of you kind of guiding the student, like, here's some things that, you know, I've noticed from all, you know, from all the things that we've done, it can come from asking them to self-assess. Even if you had like a pretty simple checklist of these are the skills that we're working on. And you can even just take it from like this unit right now that we're in. And these are the skills that we hope to be working towards by the end of this unit. What do you want to pick to focus on? And then have them set some, sometimes people will say set some goals. I like to say set an intention. Like I have an intention that I'm going to be. Oh, I like that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Just, I don't know. It just like adds a little bit. I don't know. It makes it feel a little more serious. I guess so if I'm going to set an intention, you know, and I'm declaring it. Um, right. But also I think sometimes we ask kids to self-assess and set goals and then we just don't touch it or we don't come back to it or like it was kind of a great activity to go through and then there it goes and the, and the goal gets forgotten. So I like to also encourage that teachers don't just have kids set an intention, but that you uh, have an action plan. Like, so what's that going to look like? Who else needs to know? What support do you need in order to work on this attention, this intention? Like, is it a parent one? Is it a, is it like a, another student in a class? Like maybe you're trying to to get into a different kind of genre of books. I'm just throwing out something random that might be something that a kid would want to do. And maybe, you know, as a teacher, you can recommend because you've been sitting down and having these conversations with each kid and really knowing like, what are their interests? What do they like to do? What do they like to read? What gets them excited? Those kinds of things. You can then say, oh, you know, um, Susan really likes to read fantasy novels. And you're thinking about like reading some fantasy books. Maybe you two should get together during reading time and she can recommend some titles for you to try, you know, something like that. So that it doesn't always have to be teacher led um, when we're talking about these, these intentions and these instructional goals that we're setting. Okay. And do you also give it like a time frame, like check-in points or ending Mm -hmm. period? Yeah, because there does have to be some po- progress monitoring of it. So yeah, there. when you talk about that action plan, there needs to be a, okay, and then we're going to check back in next week and see how you're doing or, or whatever. And I think that also should be flexible because it also depends on what the goal is that the kid is working on. And is it one that they probably can, you know, this intention, can they work on like in a few days? Or is it an intention that's going to take a little bit more time and so maybe some more strategy work or again, like teacher support or support at home or or whatever it might be that would take a little bit longer. So do you have like a checklist of sorts as you're going through this with the students or what would that look like from the teacher's end? So I'm, I'm sure some of our listeners are thinking like, how do I navigate this? I have like 26 children in my class. (laughs) It seems like a lot. So what are some ways we can maybe like streamline it and kind of like guide them to Because in my head, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, that seems doable, especially the 10-minute monitoring. 
But then Mm -hmm. to go from there, like you were saying, those intentions kind of like fall by the wayside. So how can we kind of prevent that from happening? Yeah. So what, what I encourage teachers to do, I kind of mentioned it earlier is create this whole reader scape profile. So what I'm, so it might be like a portfolio you might consider. It could be electronic. It could be paper. It could be something the kid holds on to. It could be something that you maybe have a binder of all your kids that you kind of pull when you pull out and when you're like sitting right next to a kid when they're reading those kinds of things. And so, yeah, so step one is, well, actually I should take a step back first of all and say like, you also should be ready to relinquish a little bit of control, (laughs) which I know for some teachers can be really hard because you are going to ask them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You're going to ask them to do a little bit of the driving. So you do have to examine your beliefs and you also have to be thinking we're, we're going to start coming from a strengths based approach here. We're not going to be in a deficit mindset. Like what are they not doing? We're going to try to focus on all the things that we see that they are doing and then show them, okay, well then these would be the next steps. So now you pick kind of thing. So, so after you've kind of like think, thought about your mindset of coming from a not deficit, but strengths-based, then when you, yeah, when you do that uh, engagement assessment, that can be 10 minutes for the whole class. That gives you a lot of information. When you're talking about finding out like their identity, that's picking like a few questions that you want to ask them. Like, so what does it look like when you read at home? Or what kind of books do you like to read? What are the things that you like to do after school? And that's, you know, many of you have already probably this time of year for when this is going to be airing have already started to kind of get to know your kids and built relationships. This is something that would be great to start the year off with, but you can do it whenever. It's not like there's any sort of like, oh boy, we can't build relationships past September. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Happens all year yeah. long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it really, it's really just having a conversation. And you know, one thing that was so interesting to me is that I was working with a teacher and she's actually been in education longer than me. And it, I had asked her about this whole process. Like, what did she think when she went through it with me? And she said, you know, it really never occurred to me to ask these questions ahead of time. And she said that what would usually happen is they would have a parent teacher conference and then the parent would say, you know, so-and-so really doesn't like reading. And then she would then go and talk to the kid and say, what are you into? And then pull in the librarian. And then they would try to figure out like, you know, match the kid to text basically. And so I think that's the thing that was something that was even eye-opening to me that I sort of thought other people did this. <laughs> I just kind of assume like when you're getting to know your readers, you're sitting down and doing this. And so that was what was eye opening for me was that I was like, oh, OK, some people are really only looking at the, you know, required assessment data. True. And they're not necessarily like finding out like, you know, does a kid hang on to something? I had another teacher that I've been working with and her student um, is a multilingual learner. And he told her when she sat down uh, to talk to him about his reading, he said, you're never going to get me to read, so you shouldn't even try. And so she was like, hmm, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> so, I, I accept said, your challenge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I said, hmm, I, th- I feel like this is a good time for you to be a scientist and be a little curious and start asking questions and finding out, like, what's the history for that kid? Like, what what has happened to get them to say I don't want to read and you're, you know, you can't make me and I'm not going to do it. And seriously, she just had to spend a couple of conversations with this kiddo. And then she discovered that he really enjoyed when his teachers read any of the Kate D. Camilla books. I mean, you know, super popular, like because when Dixie and Tiger Rising and all those. And um, she said, oh, well, hey, what if you and I read one of those books together? And he's like, oh, okay. And that was all like, seriously, that was all it took was to find what is the thing that he does like and Mm -hmm. just get in, there, you know, and get in there and just like and change it. And I think a lot of skilled teachers do this, but I just feel like the power of you kind of getting ahead of it and already knowing like, ooh, what's this kid's feelings about reading? What do they really believe about reading? Is it heavy for them? It's something that is, you know, comes with a whole bunch of stigma around it for them, or is it something that's enjoyable? And then, and just getting there. So I I hear you though, when I, when teachers are saying, yeah, but I got like 28 kids, like how am I supposed to have all these conversations? (laughs) And so that's when I always say like, you know, 
bite off only what you can chew. I mean, like take this on, like, you know, it doesn't have to get done in a day. It doesn't have to get done in a week. Like this might be something that you're going to kind of just sprinkle in whenever you have a moment, whenever kids are, are otherwise occupied working on something else. And you Wait feel in like line you for the restroom. Like quick... <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, and you don't want to forget what they say. So, you know, maybe you need to just go back to your desk and just write like a little sticky note and plop it in or, or something like that, that you feel like is really important. But the idea would be then to either go through assessment data the, the actual real assessment data that you have and do it with the kid and be really transparent. Like this is, this is, you know, who you showed up on this one particular day. I always want to clarify that because mm-hmm. as, as we know, an assessment is just like a measurement of how they were on that day, not their whole reading life. But if you're pulling in this engagement data, their identity data, and then how did they do on these assessments, like some of the strengths that they had and, and if you even have one of those checklists, like I know um, Jennifer Saravallo in her reading strategies materials, she has like a, a self-assessment checklist that I would probably use with older kids because they could actually go through and think about it and with some scaffolding. Younger kids, again, it might just be more like a, we're in this narrative unit right now and we're going to really examine character traits or, you know, something something like that. And there's like two or three skills and you know, so, you know, where do you think you are with this? Like, how easy is this for you? Or how hard is this for you? Right. So um, just like a very informal, quick pre-assessment. Yeah. 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 And then that way they can, again, then they can say, okay, well, so then what's the goal that you, you know, given that, you know, you seem to be pretty engaged during independent work time, you, you know, you, you enjoy reading, but you feel like you're kind of struggling with understanding the author's message or again, whatever it is. So then what do you want to work on? What's your intention? And then, and then again, you might have to do a little bit of scaffolding at the beginning because often kids are not used to being asked what they want to do. Right. (laughs) At school, (laughs) you know, (laughs) they're, they're, they're pretty used to being told what they're supposed to do. So I just think that then there's so much more buy-in because they have really had that voice and choice within some parameters. You know, again, it's not just like completely willy-nilly intention, but something that is going to move them forward. And then there's always the check-in, how are you doing? Is this still something you need to work on? Or can we move on to something else? And some celebration when we've met um, certain intentions and goals and having that be the just like the atmosphere, I should say, of the classroom. So I just want to clarify for our listeners, this would be occurring during like an independent reading time, correct? Yes. Or even like yeah. a small teacher reading group? Yep. Yep. Oh. So just and, kind of like weave that it into be, one of those? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not like this is like a revolutionized your whole teaching. This is <laughs> this is just a, uh, yeah. When are you having independent time? Or like what you just said, if if I've got a group of kids that kind of all want to work on the same goal, then maybe that's where we like, then now we're doing it as a small group and I'm teaching you some strategies to, because you all were noticing that you need to work on fill in the blanks skill. So we will come together as a group and work on it. So in a regular classroom, how would you feel like the breakdown of like their reading block would be in order to kind of like fit these things in? Yeah. So, I mean, context is hard with all these things because <laughs> because some people have like a great, like, you know, 90 minute block for literacy instruction. Some people have like 60 minutes. And so I guess what I would say is if you're trying to fit this in with a curriculum and you're trying to think about when are you giving time for kids to have some of the student centered instruction versus mm-hmm. when do you need to deliver some of your standards that you're required to deliver, I would try to kind of do it 50 50. But again, like when I say that, I'm saying that when I'm thinking of, you know, students that are establishing some stamina to do some work, like we're probably not going to take a 60 minute block and divide it in half for kindergartners because again, (laughs) we're kindergartners. kindergartners. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What's their stamina? And first graders even, you know, so, so everything I'm saying is with the caveat of like your context definitely matters. And it's also why I think that you know, as much as we really want there to be a silver bullet in teaching anything, there just can't be because, you know, 
people who write the curriculum are not in your classroom with your students and your context and dealing with your specific humans. And that's what's so hard about it. That's what's so nuanced about it. Um, Just like as a general rule of thumb, though, I would say, you know, if you're spending like you're doing like a lesson, like a little mini lesson, and then you're practicing some skills and then you spend that for about half of your time, then you break it down and then then you move into kind of like this, okay, now we're going to work on our goals or do our independent work time. And then you can also be pulling some small groups and be doing some of those kinds of things. That typically is what works for teachers, but you might have to adjust because obviously kids aren't going to be ready. If you've never done anything like that before, they're not going to be ready to take on that level uh, right away. Right. And I talk all the time about the daily five, which I'm sure you've read as well. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. My favorite strategies just for like managing these centers around your classroom because I wouldn't even really call it centers but it's just Mm -hmm. a way of practicing to have them sit still and read for any length of time and just be focused in their work and like you said intentional (laughs) so I love referring people to them so would you recommend something like that like what does this time period look like what are we doing now yeah and and again and what kind of model are you already like inserting this into uh depends but yeah totally like if you're doing the sisters like if you're doing the daily five like easily that could become part of the rotations you know that that they do if you are somebody who might still be using like a workshop framework this just goes right into the independent part of of reading instruction if that's what you're doing if you're someone who has moved towards something that's more like structured literacy and you Um, are trying to then figure in how does that fit, you know, you're going to need to think about like how much of your time is spent on the phonics skills, the phonemic awareness skills, word study, all all of those kind of pieces. And then where does the actual time that they get to practice these in real life, you know, because obviously we don't want to teach phonics in isolation. We want them to actually Mm -hmm. try to try it on. So you have to think about then like what, how would that fit it in your day, if you have all those other components happening, do you have to split it up across the day because it's too hard to get it all into one block? Or is it something that is uh, one teacher um, I have seen, she did some work where she always had this like weird space of like 20 minutes in between recess and their lunch. It was just how their schedule worked out. Right. (laughs) And so she was always like, how do I like by the time we've actually gotten back from recess, we almost have to like turn right around and do this, you know. And so I know she tried to do some of the other pieces there so that she could have more time for independent work, you know, in her literacy block. So like she would, that would be the time where she'd do a whole bunch of word study was like right there because she could do that fairly quickly versus wanting to give them more time for reading. So right. I don't know. There's like a lot of, Again, I I don't have a great answer for your listeners of like, just try this and it'll be all great. You know, like I don't have the magic diet pill. I don't have (laughs) have the bullet. I wish I did. But it's just some ideas of things to think about. And, you know, with everything, you know, it's always just about like giving it a try and then making it your own so that it fits your style, your classroom, your kids. Mm Because I think that's the art of teaching that can sometimes get lost when we're focusing, I mean, we need to focus on the science of teaching, but we also need to like focus on the art part, like the part that you bring to the, to the room, like you said, like they do still need us. Right. <laughs> yeah. They need us to be there. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't feel like it sometimes, but they really do need us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What would you say are just like the most critical pieces for having this student centered learning during your reading time? I think you would want to make sure that you have structure set up for independence. So kids need to know what to do. Like, where are the materials? Where do I get my answers to these questions if I get stuck? Um, Or if I am doing some sort of centers or am I doing a daily five or, you know, whatever. Like, you need to have that stuff down. Like, that structural stuff has to be down. Otherwise, you're going to have management issues, as we know, right? Right. So, so you want to make sure that you have set up your room for student-centered instruction. So there needs to be a flow to the room. There needs to be places where kids know they can go get materials independently if they need it. Um, there needs to be some procedures around, uh, you know, how do we get our books out and, you know, where do we put things away and where do we sit when we're reading and those kinds of things. 
what does it look like when the teacher pulls a group, all the, that kind of stuff definitely needs to be established first. And then also like, where are they keeping these intentions so that they can re remember what they're supposed to be working on? You know, is that like a folder that they have or is it uh, that you have it or, and but yet you give them a sticky note that's like on their desk or on their book box or on their book bag or whatever that says like, this is what I'm working on. And like, here's the date I'm going to get be checked back in with, with my te with a teacher. So Definitely some of those organizational th things I would think would be really um, important before you wanted to dive in, just so that you could feel pretty confident about, you know, what are the kids doing when they're not with you and you're trying to talk to somebody else and have an intention setting meeting and all those kinds of things. Right. Makes a lot of sense because for sure, yeah, how are they reading independently if they're not working independently too? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I've just seen the power of like, making it more relevant for the kids and making it connect to something that they find important and that they, they realize is going to be important versus a teacher directed goal that they need to be working on. Mm -hmm. and again, You still have the things that you're going to be doing. It's not like you're not going to have in the back of your mind that you also really want to make sure that you're working on you know, X, Y, Z, like when you're, when you're, when you're talking to them or giving them some notes about things, or maybe you can encourage a goal every once in a while, you know, an intention every once in a while. Um, but the buy-in, I think it's huge. Now, as you're talking, I'm just kind of picturing like, okay, the, all the kids are sitting at my, you know, reading table and we're going to have like this reading group. Would you just kind of like have your regular reading group and like dismiss everyone, but like maybe keep one student and then discuss their intentions. And then maybe the next day you pick a different student. Yep. That could be an easy way to do it. You could say, Hey, you know, kind of get kids sort of on a, it's not going to be hard and fast, but like a rotation where like, yeah, these are the kids that I'm going to check. Like I'm going to check in with two kids a day or again, it depends on like kind of what structures and time you have in your, in your schedule, but mm -hmm. yeah, easily just like one kid a day. Like you said, you could, you could keep a kid back. You could do some whole group instruction say, okay, everybody, I want to go back. But, um, Susan, why don't you stay here for a second? I want to just check in with you, you know, go get your intention, um, action plan and let's look it over or something like that. You know, it doesn't have to be a long conversation. So, you know, even if you need to try to give yourself like a set of timer on your phone or something so that you don't spend more than, you know, three minutes minutes with a kid <laughs> right? and then lose track of time. And I go, Oh wait, I was supposed to do a whole group this whole time. And it's been 15 minutes because <laughs> I know that happens to me. So, <laughs> so if you just need to kind of like give yourself a little, uh, like check on the time, Andrea, like you got, you, you got to get, get this conversation moving and get on to the next kid, you know, or get on the next group. Right. So when you're sitting down with students, do you have anything formal that you prepare for them? Sometimes like I know for like my word study groups, I'd like run off some worksheets on like, you know, short vowels or something. Are you doing that with these readers as well when they're working independently? Or are you just wanting them to kind of find and work on these skills within their books? It's going to depend on what the skill is and if they need any support ports with it because you're right like if it if it's a kiddo who is working on trying to um I don't know read read more fluently and they want to do some repeated readings maybe you do have a way that they track that and like keep track of I read this book five times and now I think I'm ready to to read it all perform it or read it aloud for somebody else or if it's something where I'm wanting especially for the older kids when we're asking them to maybe lift the level of thinking they're doing about a text and want them to write about it. Like, you mm -hmm. know, what, what theme are you noticing in this, in this, this book that you're reading? And so we want them actually to write it down. You may have some sort of a page that you want them to do. If you don't already have like a, like a, you know, like a notebook or something like that for them to be writing in or, or like you said, if it's somebody who you're trying to work on something that's a little bit more like they need to go deeper they need a bigger dose of work on long vowel sounds or something like that, then that would be a little different kind of support that you would provide for that. And maybe that wouldn't be one that you would want to do an intention setting on. I'm not sure if kids would say, I really want to work on my long vowel sounds. They might though. I don't know. It's being, it's being responsive to your students and being flexible and also just kind of letting go. Because again, they may pick an intention that that would not be the one that you would really want 
them to work on if you had your choice. <laughs> you, right. know, you don't think that's the highest priority, but you know, give them some wins, give them some success. And then, then you can start pushing up, you know, pushing up the the rigor, I guess I would say of the, of their intention and setting that they're doing. And I was just going to say that as well, like, okay, just let it go. And then like the next time, maybe you can kind of push them towards where you want them yeah. to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, when you've created this culture of we're really being student centered and we're really letting the, the kids take the driver's seat, again, it's going to be an adjustment for them at first, but then like once this is like built some momentum and you know, you, you are also being really intentional with like celebrating these big wins and, you know, you know, you can even make a big deal out of it. Uh, I mean, you don't want to embarrass a child, but <laughs> I've sometimes I've said like, do you mind if I share this with a class? And they're like, oh, sure. You know, I, and then I say, okay, everyone, I want you to stop, like, stop right now. Like I have to share, I just have to brag a little bit about what so-and-so just did. Like so-and-so has been working for two weeks on this and did it like, everybody, let's give them a round of applause. You know, if you kind of make it like that and celebratory, it's going to be, you know, you're just, you're just creating this culture of like, we can do hard things. We can work hard and we can also like decide we can, we can decide what it is that we need to work on. We can be, have that metacognition to know, like what's our next steps and how, how do we handle it? Cause that's a life skill mm-hmm. <laughs> of knowing like, what do I need to do next? For sure. And also just we're building those habits that readers need to have just long-term as well when we're doing those mm-hmm. student-centered practices. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, Andrea, I love this conversation today. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you really feel like people should know? I just want to encourage them if they haven't already, if they're not familiar with the active view of reading model from Duke and Cartwright, I don't know if you are familiar with it. They basically took the simple view of reading and Scarborough's Rope, which I know a lot of people are talking about right now. Mm-hmm. And they have added even more research about executive functioning and motivation and engagement and how that that's kind of like the first step. And then it goes into the word recognition skills that we need and the language comprehension that we need. And they have, then they have what they call these bridging processes that overlap. And so I think what that model shows is that, you know, we don't want to ignore some of these really base things of executive functioning and motivation and engagement. You know, don't, I guess I like to say, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like don't focus so much on, the middle part that then you've lost the whole purpose is we want to try to get kids to be critical thinkers. We want to get kids to enjoy reading, to love reading, to want to do it. And um, part of that is just getting them, getting them on board, (laughs) like getting them to like see the value and the relevancy for them. Right. Okay. And then I know you have a lot of resources available. So where can people find you? What can they get from you? How do they stay in yeah, touch? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would love if they would come follow me. I'm at elmtreeed.com. So it's E L M E. No, wait. <laughs> I almost I had a problem with that. E L M T R E E E D.com. And then you can also follow me on Instagram at elmtreeed. And I have a YouTube channel. Uh, where I'm doing these weekly lit bits is what I'm calling them. Teachers are submitting questions and I try to give an answer in just a little bit of time. So like 10 minutes or so or less. And, and people anonymously submit their questions. So they, I love it. Cause in that way, there's no shame. If it's like one of these things that you've been sitting in a staff meeting and like gone, why don't everybody else seems to know about this, but I don't know what this means that they're talking about. Uh, You can totally feel free to ask, any question, you know, any question and, and I'll answer. And then also right now for your listeners, I have a coupon that I hope you'll share with them that they can get 75% off of a mini course. That's really all about going through all the steps I just talked about today about examining your beliefs, some resources for how do you track engagement, some resources for questions you you might ask about getting deeper into their reading identity, other self-assessment resources, and even like a template that you could use for creating 
those uh, learning intention action plans. So, so I hope everyone that's listening takes advantage of that deal. And for sure, everything will be in the show notes so they can just click on it and it will go straight to the link to purchase. Well, thank you again. I loved having this conversation with you and I really hope the listeners take on board what you said and get that course to kind of help them out and reach out if they have any more questions. Yes, I I love to hear from them. So if they have any questions or input or anything, I would love to hear it. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Thanks. If you've loved this show, then join me in sharing the teaching. Hitting that subscribe button. And leaving us a review on iTunes. So we can be found by more teachers like you who are ready to start sharing the workload. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Find new episodes each week on shareteaching.com. Thanks for listening to the Share Teaching Podcast. You never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes hand in hand.